what if we don't have a political problem? <laughs> what if we don't have a Hollywood problem? What if we don't have an opioid problem? What if I presented these issues to you in a different way? The electorate and the elected are a reflection of those who go to the polls. Hollywood is a reflection of the audience it serves. And opioids are a numbing agent for a much deeper individual need. What if we spent so much time reacting to all of the noise around us that we miss the fundamental problem? If I accept these propositions and the general rule that they communicate, which is that our social ills are a reflection of the condition of our society, then I have to take some time to think about how our society got to where it is now. And this process logically begins at the beginning, where society is stitched together. And this part of the process is especially important to me because my day job involves stitching together one of the most fundamental aspects of society. It's to where I build my bridges, and that is to the family. In other words, my day job is making babies. But the less weird way to say that is I work in the field of in vitro fertilization. <laughs> right? You have to make things always a little bit awkward at the dinner table. <laughs> I'm very proud of this picture. This is our embryo hall of fame picture. Those are human embryos superimposed against the finest salt crystals you can find. And for an embryo to qualify to be on this picture, it had to have become a human baby. So each one of those guys are alive, and some of, some of them are in their early teens now. My goal from a 3,000-foot perspective today is to get you to think very deeply about what happens when technology doesn't just change how we live, but can begin to fundamentally change who we are. And the reason we're going to spend the rest of our time together here laser focusing in on IVF and technology is that technology that can begin to affect how a human is built serves as a test bed for our assumptions and preconceptions that inform our worldview and inform the way we live and the way our society looks at large. So I want you to sit back and relax as we go into this very specific field of IVF technology and ethics. And I want to begin by telling you a story. It's a beautiful spring morning. The lilacs are out, and you're feeling a trip to the zoo today. So you call into work, oh, tell your boss I'm sick, and you know he doesn't buy it, but it doesn't matter. You can't do anything about it. You go to the zoo, and you don't care much for zoos. Not really, but you're going to the gorilla habitat, and this part of the zoo is special to you. You walk over and you look down and you see a gorilla named Agatha. Now, while Agatha may look like all of the other gorillas in her pen, she's not just another gorilla. Not to you, at least. You see, gorilla Agatha is your birth mother. Every element of your appearance your blue eyes, your dark hair, was designed by an embryologist in the lab using sperm from an anonymous donor and eggs from an anonymous donor. And they selected and designed the embryo to specification using an embryo deselection process. And once your parents realized that renting an animal womb is much less expensive than the human alternative, the embryologist transferred your embryo into the womb of Agatha. Nine months later, out you come, fully human, perfectly healthy, and with no biological connection to your parent who is going to raise you whatsoever. You think what I'm talking about is impossible? It's not. Embryologists today using embryo selection technology can fundamentally and basically design a human. 
And once our society becomes comfortable with the idea, it is entirely possible for a gorilla to carry a human baby to term. If you still don't believe me, look it up. You've got phones. I've even put the search term up there for you. Inner cell mass transfer. This is a technique that was perfected in animals in the early 1990s. We live in a world where the evolution of technology has begun to delimit the boundaries of what we are able to do. And we as humans love this imagery. We love the idea that lines are erased, that not even the sky is the limit. It holds a certain kind of luster that we just find enticing. We do things because we can. And this mindset is something that has been pervasive throughout our Western society really since the Renaissance. I call it a can culture. We do things because we can. But the yin to this concept's yang is the idea of ought. Ought implies that our society and our behavior should be ordered in a particular way. Ought and order imply that there are limits to what we can do. It also implies that if things aren't ordered the way they ought to be ordered, we can expect to see some negative repercussions down the line. It implies also that limits are there for the sake of that we wish to protect, cherish, and promote. Now, I want you to keep these two concepts in mind as I tell you another story. I was talking with an embryologist who's from out of state, and he was telling me about a case that he was involved in. It started when a couple walked into the IVF uh, center, and they said, we want a child with a specific genotype and with a specific phenotype. Well, I mean, most IVF labs have this technology. It's commonplace now. We have it. Why not use it to serve the customer's need? They designed the embryo using donor eggs, donor sperm. And once this embryo had been selected for the specifications that the parents wanted, the parents decided that they didn't really want to go through the inconvenience of carrying the child to term. So they retained the services of a commercial a gestational carrier. It's a large industry uh, throughout the world. Six months into the pregnancy, the attending obstetrician discovered that this child has a heart defect. And it would require corrective open heart surgery to correct shortly after birth. This wasn't the product that the parents had ordered. This isn't what they signed up for. The child wasn't really even theirs, not theirs genetically, and it hadn't been born yet. Really, all this presented was a very expensive failed investment. So they abandoned the child in utero. The gestational carrier, despite the parents, decided to carry this child to term and said that she would raise the child. On the appointed day, she brought the child for the open heart surgery. But while the child was recovering in the intensive care unit, she realized that there are long-term repercussions to her decisions, and this isn't what she signed up for either. She, too, abandoned the child. As I started wrestling with the concepts of can and ought in my own work and dealing with messy situations like this one, I came to the realization that we can use extreme and powerful technology that is the same, but the philosophies and the assumptions that lead into it and its application can be as different as night and day. Let me give you an example of what I mean. A couple comes to an infertility clinic, they meet with a doctor, and they're suffering from miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage. Well, going to the extremes of what we are capable of on a technological level, we can use a procedure that's been used throughout all of these examples that I've mentioned, pre-implementation genetic screening, and we can determine that this couple is suffering from a rare genetic disease that is embedded in the embryos. The majority of their embryos have it, some don't, and this disease causes spontaneous abortions at three weeks of gestational age. Now, using this technology, we can go in and transfer one of the few embryos that don't have this genetic disease. As a result, this couple can have a child, and this genetic disease that has been plaguing this family line can be eradicated for generations to come. You see, there's this misnomer that the concept of ought is prudish, that if you subscribe to the idea of limits, that that will steer you away from advancement and progress. 
Now, as we're wrestling through these examples together, let me assure you that that is a false dichotomy. You can be very aggressive in your science, but very thoughtful in how you apply it. Let me tell you one final story. A couple of parents this time come into an infertility clinic, and they bring their four-year-old daughter with. It turns out, as we're having this conversation, that their daughter has bone marrow cancer. And if she doesn't receive a bone marrow transplant from an exact donor genetic match, she will be dead within two years. Can you imagine what this family must be going through? Their only child, their first child, dying as they watch. But there's a treatment for this. Theoretically, we can use what's called HLA typing selection to create a number of embryos. And an embryologist can go in there with the wisp of a needle no larger than a fraction of the width of your hair and a blast from a laser scalpel. This embryo can be selected and this embryo can be transferred over into the mom. This mom can carry this child to term and the birth of the baby boy can lead to the ability to potentially save the life of the older sibling with a bone marrow transplant that can happen just a few months after birth. The younger life gave sustenance to the older life. Both children can live. Can this procedure be performed? Yes, of course it can. Technology is there. It's easy. Ought this procedure to be performed? Ought we to create new human life for the purpose of another? Does it set a dangerous precedent of creating human life for functionally the ability to have spare parts? Is this a road we ought to go down? In the time that I've been around in the industry, our embryologists have encountered iterations of this case twice. And I'm not going to tell you what we did in those cases because that would defeat the purpose of why I'm here today. I want you to work through this for yourself. But as we're taking a step back now and moving out of the world of infertility technology and going back to the bigger picture that we were talking about earlier, I do want to leave you with two questions just to help you get started on the thinking process. Question number one might be an obvious one. Are you a can person or are you an ought person? And depending on your answer to this question, I suggest you ask yourself a follow-up for the can people. If you're a canned person, have you considered the consequences of your ideas? Are you ready to live in a delimited world and all that it entails? Many people absolutely pick this option. So you're not in the minority if you're out there. Question for the odd people. If you are an odd person, are you clear on what informs your concept of what ought is. And let me just kind of bat down a notion right out of the gate. Ought cannot be informed by unique individual conviction. Because if ought is informed by unique individual conviction, then we've masterfully gone full circle and we live in a canned society. If people determine for themselves what ought is on an individual basis, then that is fundamentally what a delimited society is, right and wrong determined at will. So if you decide that you are an odd person, you need to be very clear and have something more transcendental than just individual human whim. I hope you see why I believe this discussion is so valuable. You see, talking about IVF biotechnology and technology that can begin to affect human life teases out this fundamental question of can and ought. And by thinking through this, we discover what our assumptions and preconceptions are that inform how we live our lives and what our society looks like on the aggregate. You'll remember at the beginning, I asked a series of three questions. And these questions hinge on the idea that the things we see on our newsfeed in the morning when we're trying to get out of bed and that make us want to facepalm right back into the pillow <laughs> might actually be a reflection of who we are. 
And if we don't like what we see in the mirror, do we need to ask ourselves the question if perhaps our society, and dare I say it, our individual lives are not ordered the way they ought to be? And if I come to this conclusion, does that change how I deal with the problems I find on my own street corner? I want you to think about this deeply because ideas have consequences. And like in the field of infertility and IVF, some of those consequences can extend to life and death situations. And I promise you, you do not want to be thinking about this for the first time when you're in the hot seat. So think about it deeply. Think about it deeply now. I promise you, it'll be worth your effort. And remember, Agatha is always right around the corner. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>